بسم اللہ الحمد للہ وصلاۃ وسلام علیہ رسول اللہ عام آباد اینڈ بردرس اینڈ سسٹرس ایز وی آل نو وی ٹیون ان فار سیرا السرات النبویہ اب بک بائی شیخ البانی رحم اللہ اب ویری پرومیننٹ شیخ آف آر ٹائم مے اللہ بلیس ہم وٹ ایور ورک ہی ایز ڈن ہی ایز گیون ٹو دس اما اینڈ ہی لیف دا ورلڈ مے اللہ میک اٹ ایزی فار ہیم ان دا گریو and may Allah raise his status. So the Shaykh who has actually written this book is like one of the best Shaykh you can find in the modern times who has actually written about Hadith. He mastered Hadith from inside out. So whatever Hadith grading you have seen. So for example, if someone has actually done some sort of studies of uh, Hadith, there are grades of Hadith. There is a Sahih Hadith, there is a Hassan Hadith, there is a Daif Hadith, which is basically weak Hadith, and there is Mothu Hadith, which is basically the Hadith which is not true at all. So the grading, you can see that it, it is mostly like Sahih, and in the bracket it's Albani. So it's basically, basically this Shaykh. He has done studies in the Hadith. He mastered it completely. And this is basically his book. Sira al-Sirat in nababiya which basically is uh, based on hadith itself it's not like any other hadith it is sorry it is not like any other sira book that you have seen which are basically story tales and what authors actually do they actually try to make it more interesting so that people read it like novel and stuff but this book it is completely based on uh, facts that's it And it will also debunk some of the things that you have heard about, uh, heard from Sira or you have heard about it from people. So we will be completing, inshallah, four, five chapter today. And uh, so the first chapter is basically the noble ancestry of Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And uh, Allah also says in the Holy Quran that uh, he does not send any messenger from the bad ancestry. So all of the messengers are basically from the best of the ancestry. And what is ancestry is basically your father, your forefather, and then your forefather. That is basically your ancestry. So prophets' ancestries are basically from a very noble families. They have a very uh, good backgrounds. So Allah says in the Quran in Surah, Ver, Surah Anam, verse 6, Allah knows best with whom to place his message. So that also tells you that, okay, prophets are basically from good ancestry. Then we have some names. I will not be mentioning all of the names of Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, but some of the names are Abu Al-Qasim, Abu Ibrahim, Muhammad, Ahmad, Al-Mahi, Al-Hashir. And there are a lot of them. The hadith, which if, you, if someone wants to refer to, they can actually find it in Sahih Bukhari, Sahih Muslim, and Musnad Ahmad. Then comes the ancestry of Prophet وسلم, which actually makes him different from other Prophet which actually came after the Ibrahim السلام. So our Prophet actually comes from Ismail السلام, unlike other Prophets which actually came from uh, Isaq السلام. So the ancestry goes like this that he comes from Ibrahim السلام, then from Ibrahim السلام, we have Ismail السلام, Then we have Banu Qinana, which is basically like a tribe, a very prominent tribe of their time. They're like very noble at their time. And then from Abu Qinana, we have Quraysh. And from Quraysh, our prophet was from Banu Hashim. Banu Hashim was like the top of the top clan of Quraysh. And he actually comes from Banu Hashim. So this also tells you that, okay, our prophet actually comes from a very noble background. Subhanallah. Now let's discuss about the birth of Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Again, a very important thing and you will also learn that what type of things people have actually made out of this. But what does the Hadith say? So we have the Hadith. Hadith is Sahih Muslim and uh, you can see the reference number. It is 1162. Uh, it has been narrated by Abu Qatada radiallahu an. He says he was that the Prophet was actually asked about fasting on Mondays, that why he actually used to fast on Mondays. So he actually said that this is the day on I was born. (coughs) 
so he says that this is the day on which i was born and on which i actually received the prophethood and this is the day on which i also received the revelation from jibril alaihi salam so from there we actually know that okay the day on which prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam was born it is monday okay and which year was it the year was the year of elephant you can also see the hadith it is in tirmidhi 6 uh, 3619 now the year of elephant is basically uh, when abraha uh, the cruel ruler of the time uh, he actually came to attack kaaba and uh, he actually took a lot of elephants to destroy the kaaba and uh, allah then sent ababil birds to destroy that army and you can actually learn more about it in surah al-fil it is complete surah is basically on this incident itself so you can learn from it now comes a very important thing so if i am actually mentioning something here you can also check it let me just tell you how to check it so basically this is the hadith let's just search it on google and uh, you can see you can find it on sunnah.com it is basically a collection of uh, hadith So if I click here, you will find this hadith over here. So you can see it. I just said the same exact thing. It is in Sahih Muslim, and you can also see the references. Now the another point of telling you this thing is that every hadith basically has some sort of category. In Arabic, we actually call it bab, but in English, we can actually call it category. so in sahi muslim we can also see sahi muslim also has a lot of categories okay and you will see the category on which the birth day of uh, sorry the day is basically the monday which is which is mentioned it is under the category of book of fasting so imam muslim because the hadith is from muslim sahi muslim so imam muslim actually puts it this hadith under the category of book of fasting So now comes the question of people who actually celebrate Mawlid. So Imam Muslim, first thing is that he actually puts it under the book of fasting. He didn't put put it under the category of two Eid. He didn't put it under the category of celebration. Nothing like that. And the second point is that the Hadith basically encourages us to fast. It is not telling us to do feasting. It is not telling us to celebrate. Nothing like that. Third point is. that monday does not comes once a year monday actually comes a lot of times approximately 52 times a year then the hadith mentions the day it does not mentions the exact date because it why it is not mentioning the exact date because we don't know about the exact date and uh, the most of the report on which you will find that what is that date it is 12th of rabiul awwal on which they actually celebrate the birthday of prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam uh is also they also mention the same thing that this is the day we know about it that this is the date on which prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam passed away from this world so what are we actually trying to celebrate are we trying to celebrate his birthday or we are trying to mourn his death that is also another question fifth point is that why didn't companions mention to these imams or their tabain tabain are basically the students of companions and their taba tabain tabe tabain is basically the students of students of uh, companions why didn't they actually mention the date of prophet's birthday are we actually trying to tell us uh, tell that we knew islam better than the companions which is not true right and one more thing is that if we uh, we are what we are actually trying to do on this date we are trying to celebrate the birthday but uh, fasting is not done by anyone and again one more important thing is that if it was allowed to celebrate this thing why it is recommended to fast because on other two eats it is not recommended to fast you you are not allowed to fast on uh, both eat and you are also not allowed to fast on uh, on the friday itself right which is also the third eid so that is something to th- think about now comes the some of the time uh, some of the signs which actually took place during the birth of prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam one very important thing is that when he was born 
Jewish and Christians actually knew about it. And how they actually knew about it? Because it was mentioned in their books. It was mentioned in Injil. It was mentioned in other books as well, which was actually given to them as a revelation from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So the incidence is from Hassan, not Hassan, different Hassan, Hassan ibn Thabit radiallahu uh, He actually said that uh, he was actually a child of uh, seven to eight years and uh, he actually didn't reach maturity at that time, but he was actually capable of understanding what is going on. But uh, what he actually heard, he actually heard that, okay, there are group of Jewish, there was one Jew, he was actually shouting, he was literally screaming in Yatrib. Yatrib is basically another name for Medina. He was shouting and he was saying, uh, and then a group of Jewish actually collected, they came and they heard him and they actually asked him, why are you screaming, right? So he was like, the star of Ahmed has risen. And that star is basically indicating his birth. So from here, we actually come to know that, okay, other people, people of the book, Jewish and Christians, actually know about the birth of Prophet Wasallam. But uh, they actually didn't, uh, they actually disbelieved out of stubbornness. Because Allah says in the Quran, in Surah Baqarah, verse 146, Allah says, those whom we send the scriptures, which means Jewish and Christians, recognized Prophet Muhammad as they recognize their son. But verily, a party of them conceals the truth while they know it. That is that they, actually the qualities of Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, was actually mentioned in Torah and in Injil, which is gospel. But those people actually hide the truth. They don't want to, they don't want people to know about it. They don't want people to come to the right path because they were so busy with their idols, praying to their idols and stuff. And uh, another thing which actually comes in the same category, it is a different chapter, but it is it is the same thing. There is, in some of the Sira books, it is mentioned that when he was, Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, when he was born, uh, some buildings were on fire and uh, a lot of things was going on. People were running here and there. But we actually don't find any form of uh, hadith which actually confirms it. So it is more like a story. It is not something which is true. That is also something. Now comes the froster mothers of Prophet, peace be upon him. The most famous froster mother of Prophet Muhammad, we all know, it was Halima, Halima al-Sadia. Al but before her, there was one more. In this, uh, so basically, there are like four or five prophet, uh, froster mothers of prophet, peace be upon him. But in this book, only two are mentioned. And uh, so we don't know about the other authentic sources. But uh, these two are uh, from the authentic sources. So the first froster mother of my prophet, peace be upon him, was Thuaiba, uh, Thuaiba? not Radiallahu one for her, because we don't know whether she actually converted to Islam or not. Uh, she was basically a slave of Abu Lahab, may Allah curse him, and uh, she was actually freed. And the story is like that she used to suckle Prophet وسلم, and uh, after Prophet married Khadija bin Khalid uh, he used to come to her home and she also used to come to his home. They used to exchange gift and... Um, Everything was positive. So, but she actually didn't convert it to Islam. That's for sure. Then another another one is Halima, and uh, one famous incidence is when two people actually comes to Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, and uh, those people there were two men who actually came to him. They were wearing white clothes, and uh, they actually hold him while he was playing with his froster brother. They took hold on, of him and they cut open his chest and uh, they took his heart out and there was a black clot of blood on his heart and they cut it out and they threw it. After that, they actually, they actually brought a golden basin with them and in that it was actually filled with ice and they washed his heart and chest with that ice and then they actually sealed it and that's it. So later on, we actually came to know that it was indeed Jibreel al-Islam from another hadith of Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. 
and uh, in during this hadith there is one very important thing that when they actually sealed his chest they actually what they did is they actually one of them was like okay let's measure this person with 10 people of his ummah okay so they were waiting prophet muhammad peace be upon him with 10 people of our ummah and our prophet actually outwitted them then they tried it with 100 and again the same thing and then they tried with 1000 people and again the same thing so jibril alayhi salam was like okay let's leave it uh, because even if you wait the entire ummah with the weight of prophet muhammad peace be upon him he will still outweigh them all so that basically tells you it's not like he was very heavy it's not like that it actually tells you that the what level he actually has it's basically just that that subhanallah the level that allah subhanahu wa taala has given to him the honor that allah subhanahu wa taala has given to prophet muhammad peace be upon him that he is from the best uh that he is from the best clan the best noble family and he is the best person in the children of uh, adam and stuff like that that actually tells us to honor our prophet and nothing else then comes a very sad part of the life of prophet peace be upon him when his mother was passed away when he was at the age of 6 his father passed away when he was not even born and his mother passed away when he was the age of 6 this also tells you that our prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam he suffered a lot during his time a lot of things will happen when we will be reading this thing so this uh, we actually came to know about this situation from another very famous hadith this hadith is actually mentioned in musnad ahmad and uh, it actually happened after the conquest of makkah when conquest of makkah was occurred uh, this hadith is after that so this incidence is basically after that so there is one place called waddan so some sahaba actually went with prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam to waddan and uh, uh, prophet peace be upon him he said that remain at your place until i return and he actually went alone to mountain okay and then when he actually returned he he actually had a very heavy heart and he was actually weeping so some from some riwaya we actually come to know that other uh, sah- some sahaba said that we didn't saw him this much sad in his entire life so he was that level of sadness was in his heart at that period of time and umar ibn al khattab radhiyallahu anhu he actually asked him oh messenger of allah what actually makes you weep why are you crying tell us what what is something we can do about it so this also tells you about how some things about uh, so if the messenger is sad how the companions would react they used to panic they were like okay what actually happened explain us what is something we can actually do about it so that is what umar ibn al khattab was doing because they actually know the honor of prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam so that's how they used to honor him so prophet peace be upon him he actually replied to umar ibn al khattab and he said that i actually went to the grave of my mother amna bint wahab i actually he actually went to her grave and he actually sought permission from his lord to intercede for her so but allah actually didn't granted him that permission and then he was actually overtaken by the affection of her and that actually made him cry so that also tells you that there there are a lot of people who actually say okay we are going to be doing whatever we want to do in this life and our prophet is going to be saving us from whatever is going to be happening we can do shirk we can do we we will not pray namaz we will not read quran we will not give zakat we will not do hajj and umrah while we can but still prophet will intercede for her for all of them for all of the ummah but here you can see he actually try to intercede for his mother basically his mother but allah subhanahu wa taala didn't give him the permission because um, his parents were actually not on islam his parents were actually uh, uh, like just like other people during that time so this also tells you this also there, there is a very important message for all of us that prophet peace be upon him will only intercede for the people who are on his sunna who are following his track just take one example let's just say there is a person x and there is a person y so person x is doing some sort of things 
and person Y is actually following him. And uh, person, so basically person person Y is actually very influenced with person X and he, he is also doing the same things as person X is doing. So will person X be happy with person Y? Definitely, right? If I am actually teaching something and people are actually following my teachings, definitely I will be happy, right? But if I am actually not even, if my if people are not even listening to me and they are doing things which I have said, do not do this thing. I literally spend my entire life telling the same message that don't do this thing, stop this, this and that. But still people are doing this. Will I help them? Definitely I will not, right? Same is with the prophet, peace be upon him as well. He spent his entire life, as we will read in the Sira, that he, uh, the only message he actually spread was the message of monotheism. The message that there is one God, you should pray to him. Right? That was the entire message. That is the basic foundation of Islam. But if someone is like, okay, I will be doing polytheism, I will be praying to people of the grave, but still Prophet وسلم, will actually intercede for me. That is actually not happening. And again, some people will actually ask why Prophet وسلم, gave the permission to visit us to the grave. So this permission was actually granted after the conquest of Makkah. So before that, Sahabas were actually not allowed to go to the grave of their mothers and parents and their relatives. It was prohibited to them. But and why Prophet peace be upon him actually did that? He actually did it so that people don't misguide themselves. So that they don't go to grave and they, they were like, okay, let me just pray to them. This is the concern he had for his companions. So just think the concern he should be having for all of us. And again, one important thing is that you can actually find that these graves were not actually permanent graves because Prophet وسلم, actually prohibited from making the permanent graves. He actually prohibited to do whitewashing on grave. He actually prohibited us from writing on the grave and he also prohibited us from building anything over the grave. But that is what we are seeing all around us. Basically in Southeast Asia, what is actually happening? If someone dies, we have a mazar for him and people just go and pray. That's what we do, right? But the Hadith of Sahih Muslim just says the opposite. So, my one question for all of us is the same. That if, we, if you are going to be telling the people of the grave that, okay, this is wrong, they will be saying that you are a Wahhabi or you are someone who is not following the Sunnah of Rasulullah Wasallam. And what I am reading right now, I am literally reading Sahih Muslim, the Hadith of Sahih Muslim. And people will be like, okay, some people who are arrogant, what they will say? They will be like, oh, this is not a correct Hadith, stuff like that. But this Hadith is in Sahih Muslim. How can you deny that? If, if a Muslim, if a Mormon is actually denying the Sahih Hadith, Sahih Muslim and Sahih Muslim, Sahih Bukhari and Sahih Muslim, they are not on correct path. That is one thing. And second thing is that, okay, if they are believing the entire Hadith, but not this one, but the chain of this hadith comes from Ali ibn Abu Talib radiallahu anhu, subhanallah. The chain of narration comes from Ali ibn Abu Talib radiallahu anhu. So that is the beauty of this hadith. And there is one important hadith. Uh, that we have regarding the parents of Prophet, peace be upon him. And the hadith is that it, it has been narrated from Anas ibn Malik, one, that a person actually came to Messenger of Allah and he actually asked Messenger of Allah that, where is my father? So Prophet وسلم, said that your father is basically in the fire. Basically he is in the Jahannam because his father was uh, not on the correct path. His father was not following the right Islam. So he said that uh, he is actually in fire. So that person actually didn't like what the Prophet said and he actually turned away from him. So the Prophet وسلم, called him and he said, Verily, my father and your father are in Jahannam. Rest Allah knows the best, but let me just leave you with this hadith that this is the hadith that we have. Now, uh, Al-Almani who are basically 
uh i can actually mention the hadith number but the thing is that uh, it will actually take a lot of time what i can do is that after the se- session i can actually put it on my story that whatever hadith numbers i have mentioned i can just put it entire thing on the story let me just know if that works for you so uh, back to the topic al albani actually uh, debunk some people who were like okay this hadith is basically not true and uh, stuff like that and he has done the entire debunk of this thing this whole situation and it is like three or four pages so i actually don't want to go to this thing so those were basically the chapters which we have actually completed so it is basically a long session it will actually go uh, we are actually taking it slowly in the beginning because i don't want to feed you all with a lot of information on the day one but uh, whatever we are actually reading here it is like uh, it it should be learned by everyone so the the aqida of everyone or the basic belief of everyone should be that we should know how our prophet actually lived that's the entire purpose of reading the sura basically the life that we actually have we have taken it in 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 a grant right we are doing our work we are just praying literally not even praying sometimes we just miss out on prayers most of the times we are not fasting because we think we are weak or we will fall sick or we are not giving zakat because we think that okay it will reduce our wealth so the entire purpose of sira is to learn this that those people basically they didn't even have anything when you will learn about the wars you will you will see that how how do these people even used to fight that they literally don't have anything to eat have nothing to drink but they are still fighting just for the cause of allah subhanahu wa taala and this is what the umma has actually forgotten this is the thing that we all have forgotten and that's the only reason why we are suffering so when we actually uh, let me just give you a perspective of a student of knowledge i am not the student of knowledge but what uh, what actually goes on in the process of becoming a student of knowledge so basically we start with two things it's not salah or uh, quran or uh, zakat nothing like that they, those are the five basic principles which we all have to do regardless but it starts from aqida it starts from your creed and it starts with your sira you learn how the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam tried and he he did he actually did his best he gave his best so that his ummah does not suffer that's it there is a very beautiful hadith where people of quraish actually came to prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam and they were like o oh, prophet of allah if you can actually make the amount of safa amount of gold and basically people who have actually gone to hajj or umrah they must have seen the safa and marwa uh, so the uh, the entire mountain of safa it is not like it is right now uh let me just show you the image if uh, if we can actually find it so yeah this mountain is basically uh, it was not like this before it should be like this these are safa and marwa so our prophet uh, they actually told now you can actually see the area of this thing it is very it was very big mountain but for the uh ease of people al saud actually made it uh, like this uh, so you can actually see that uh, uh so you can actually see that uh, this is a very big mountain so those people of quraish actually came to prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam and they said that if you can actually make the mountain of safa a mountain of gold a literal mountain of gold we will actually convert to islam and then Uh, Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam prayed to Allah subhanahu wa taala to do it, and then Jibreel alaihi salam actually came to Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam and he said that Allah has granted you the permission to make you this thing into gold. He will convert this thing into gold, but the condition is that uh, the forgiveness and uh, anything like that on and the mercy will be ended from your ummah. Then your ummah will not be obliged to. Uh, it will not be applic- applicable for the umma of prophet muhammad peace be upon him to have mercy or anything like that and what did our prophet said 
he said oh leave this thing um, i have different ways to convey the message of allah to these people but the only thing i want from my ummah is mercy and patience and nothing else so this is the prophet we are actually talking about the prophet who gave his entire life just for us just so his ummah can actually benefit just so his ummah can actually live a better life as well as the hereafter that's the that's that's the beauty of sira and that's the only reason why we all are actually 